Uh, I am recording. So like I said, what we'll do, we'll start chapter eight um, in here, because there's some things that I kind of want you guys to do first anyway, and then I will still put up the full recording of chapter eight, so you guys have that as well, okay? I'm not gonna just do like half what we didn't cover, I'll just put the whole thing up. Um, all right, I gotta share my screen. Okay, so let's, let me just remind you what's due. Well, next Monday, right? Chapter eight case study and what else? The review sheet. I feel like there was something else. No, oh, maybe not. That's it, right? Yeah, these two things, right? Chapter eight case study and that completed exam two review sheet. I actually modified that review sheet a little bit to add in some extra things that you're gonna have to, but we'll do that kind of at the beginning of starting chapter eight, so you'll see. Um, it's not like anything crazy, it's just um, terms. I just wanna make sure you guys kind of um, define some terms at the beginning of that, that review sheet. Okay, so yes, those are the two things that will be due on Monday, and then we'll be taking that exam on Wednesday. Okay, let's look at this. Did every, let's see if everyone, uh, you know what? So if you didn't hand in your chapter six case study, I'm giving you a zero because we are not waiting to do that. So um, if it's late, like you didn't hand it in by 1120, I'm gonna give you a zero because I'm gonna open up these answers here so that we can look at them together. Let me pull that up and then let me pull up the case study from here. Here. Juliet Hernandez is the one that we were supposed to do, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, let's look at this case study. Oh, I remember this one, I think. Okay, so it is our case study on Juliet Hernandez. So let's take a look at this and then we can talk about what we wrote. I'll show you what the book answers are. Sometimes they're funny. Um, all right. What we got here? Okay, what did you guys write down for number one? Somebody either in the classroom or on Zoom, who wants to volunteer their answer for, for number one? Yeah, so finances, right? Income. Thank you, that's pretty obvious, right? Um, but this doesn't, you know, this is something to think about, obviously it doesn't only pertain to Ms. Ms. Hernandez, right? But other um, patients may be in the same um, sort of predicament, right? Okay, so number two. Okay, now somebody who said that, was it Natasha? Right, somebody before we talk about the answers, Natasha asked last week, is it okay that I kind of put one thing in number two here, but then when it, when you got to like, when it started giving you more information, she got to number four, she was like, oh, then that's probably not it. But that, the answer to that is yes, it's totally fine, right? Based on the information that's given here, there are a few possible, um, you know, reasons for those symptoms, right? Okay, so Natasha, why don't you tell, why don't you share what you did put for that? Um, number two, I guess. Um, my book is a huge problem because um, it can lead to respiratory problems and my mom can always just avoid that. Yeah, I mean, and potentially, yeah. And so, um, so yeah, I could see how you might pick tobacco there with just given that information for number two, right? You guys see that? Um, what, is, what are some other answers that people put? What'd you guys write down for number two? Cocaine. Cocaine, did you look ahead? No. <laughs> okay. You can, you can have an option. You can, yeah. Because yeah. like, she's a struggling artist. She probably puts all of her money into cocaine or anything like that. But I'm, I'm thinking because you can also do cocaine, like just put it on your gums and stuff, and you can get sores around your mouth. Yeah, and missing teeth and stuff like that. That's usually a sign of that, too. But you're right. You rub it, yeah, put on your gums. So the sores around your mouth is probably a result of that. Um, yeah, okay. 
Was did I anyone put, else put something yeah. else? So like I put um alcohol because um one of the I guess things that stem from alcohol use is cancer and specifically like mouth cancer. And then I saw that like having stores around the mouth can be um a sign of that. So that's what I put. Yeah, it could be. But what about the sinus problems? You just kind of thought maybe that's just kind of something separate or whatever? Oh, I I blame that on like so I said that the sinus problems could lead to like headaches and stuff like that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I mean you could you could, right? Consider that as being something a symptom of something else. Okay. What else? What are some other things that you might put? So I think there are um, a couple different answers that you could have put here for number two is the, is, is the point, right? Um, and it would still be a correct answer, right? As long as your reason made sense, yeah? Um, what else? What are some other things that you guys put? Anyone put anything different? Uh, Sierra? Okay, that's... So, but I mean, around the sores around her mouth, maybe not, but I could definitely see for the sinus problems, right? That it could be just a result of, yeah, toxicity due to whatever, you know, kind of paint she's using. Um, again, you don't have much information about what she's using. So, yeah, you don't really know, right? It could be, or even some other solvent that she uses to thin out the paint, right? Like paint thinners or, um, I, I don't know. There's, there's definitely some chemicals that could potentially lead to that. Yeah. So again, as long as you put a reason for why you chose that and it made sense, then it's fine. All right, let's move on to the next, next uh, set of information here. All right, what do we got? Let me move this a little bit out of the way. Okay, so read through this and then let's talk about what we put for number three. All right, so number three asks, based on this information, what are some of the risk factors, right, for, for basically, oh, this is messing up my shirt, um, a substance use disorder? What'd you guys put for risk factors there based on that information? Uh, she said that um, her parents uh, abused her, so I said, like, either any of the abuses that she could have faced yep. or trauma. Yep, okay, so, so correct. Um, she lists physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. So that's one of them. What else? Her parents were both addicted to drugs. Correct. Her, her parents were all, also both addicted to drugs. Yep, that's another one. What else? Maybe her financial situation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yep. What else? I that she's around people. Because she's around people. Her friends, they smoke and they drink. Okay, so that's like, right, we talked about social environment, right? That, that's part of the social environment that can impact health. So, yeah. Um, so, who she's associating with. All right. What else? But are those risk factors or are those a result of, of kind of her substance use? Probably more of a result, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the cigarette smoking definitely kind of is a risk factor. And remember we talked about, remember I mentioned this comorbidity between psychiatric illness and smoking. Obviously, psychiatric illness and abuse, there's a huge connection there, right? So um, I think the smoking is kind of all part of this, kind of fits kind of all in and kind of gives you clues that there's definitely something more going on, right? Um, okay, I think we probably hit on most of those risk factors, right? All right, now the next question says, what findings during the physical exam? So now this is talking about the things towards the end of that, that paragraph, right? Um, cause you to suspect that Ms. Hernandez substance use may be more than she described in her history, right? Because at first, probably as most patients do, they'll deny that they do anything bad, right? Because they don't wanna um, tell you that, right? Um, so what do you think? What were some of the things that you put for number four? Physical examination, though. 
Yeah, so now this is the those things like irritability, nervous. What else? Glassy eyes. She's unable to sit still, right? These all indicate that perhaps there's something more going on, right? Okay? So again, make sure you pay to, you know, you, you read the questions carefully, right? If it's in physical examination, then you want to only pull out those types of clues, right? Um, okay, anything else you guys added there? Zoom people? Nothing, right? All right, let's move on. Okay. Why is this this stupid thing there? Oh, I guess I can close that. That's annoying. Oops. Oh, that's just a slideshow thing? I didn't know what that was. Sorry. We'll go back to that. I don't know why that thing needs to be there, but anyway, it's right over the question. Let's move it. Okay. Let's read this and then talk about number five. Jeez, right? So there's a lot going on in this last, uh, is this the last paragraph or there's one, there's one other, two other questions, right? Um, so, yeah. What do we got going on here? So, well, let's, let's, let's just answer the questions, I guess, and then we can, I can add in if it doesn't address it. So what complications of cocaine abuse did Ms. Hernandez exhibit in the emergency department? What'd you guys write down for this? Okay. Irregular and rapid pulse. Yep. So irregular and rapid pulse. Okay. Dilated pupils. Confusion. Well, I mean, that's why she went to the emergency department, right? So. And then it says there she begins to communicate. But all of this, I mean, she's in the emergency department when she gets an ECG, right? This is all part of, of that, right? So ECG shows cardiac dysrhythmia. What is that? What does that mean? An irregular heart rate. What does it mean? Okay. Now the ECG though, what does the ECG show you? What's an ECG? It's like Isn't the that like the of your heart. Oh, who first started talking? Yeah. Sorry. Annabelle is talking. Annabelle got this. What, what does an ECG show you or tell you? It's the electrical tracing of your heart. Yeah, correct. It's the electrical tracing of your heart, right? And it, it, the, the ECG wave corresponds with the electrical activity in your heart and basically what's happening, right? In terms of like the ventricles contracting, and relaxing, right? And the atria uh, contracting and relaxing. So it tells you about that that heartbeat, essentially, right? And sort of, um, so anyway, if that heart gets into this um, abnormal sort of pattern, right? I mean, it can lead to cardiac arrest, which is ultimately what happened to her, right? Um, what do you need to revive somebody like that that has something like that going on, right? When you say you're like an AFib or VFib, what do you use, Annabelle? Electricity. Yes, correct. Right. So, um, and what do you call that? Defibrillation or cardioversion. Yeah. So there's a right a defibrillation device. I mean, even everywhere has it. In fact, I don't even know where ours is on campus. But if you're certified in CPR, you're certified to use a simple, um, you know, version of that device because CPR is not going to help that person's heart get back into its normal electrical. Um, pattern, right? So you need that electricity or that shock to get it back into that normal rhythm. So anyway, so that's kind of, again, that a result of the cocaine, right? Um, now what about, what about here? The paramedics administered 
Naloxone, why? Uh, does it reverse a cocaine overdose? No. But what overdose does it reverse? Opioid overdose. Thank you. An opioid overdose, right? Like heroin overdose. Okay. So in that case, that didn't that didn't really help her, right? So she began to seize. Um, she began to seize. They gave benzodiazepines. There's a lot of like a lot of stuff in this one paragraph here. So they gave benzodiazepines. Somebody else other than Annabelle. Why would they give that if, when she began to seize? What neurotransmitter do benzodiazepines in general um, sort of interact with or affect? Nobody? Is it like GABA? Yes, right? Uh, benzodiazepines um, will increase levels of GABA. And what does GABA do or what's the sort of, again, I don't know, overall function of GABA as a neurotransmitter. Inhibitor. Inhibitor, it's inhibitory, okay? So why would you give something that increases GABA if somebody's seizing? To block it. Well, why would it stop the seizing? Yeah, I mean, well, what's a, what's a seizure a result of? I guess that's the question I'm getting at. What's this, what is a seizure a result of? What's going on in a, during a seizure? Nope. Lack of blood flow to the brain is what? Stroke. Seizures what? Somebody on Zoom, what, what happens during a seizure? An excess, like electrical firing from your brain. Yeah. Cor correct, an increase in brain activity, right? Increase, again, increased brain activity, meaning, yes, you can think of more signals being sent, right? from neuron to neuron, essentially, and too many, right? And so it's kind of like this overload, and so that's what induces the seizure. So it's usually, you know, an increase in glutamate. Remember, glutamate's the excitatory neurotransmitter? So that's why we want to increase GABA to inhibit, right? So these neurons are firing, firing, firing when they shouldn't be, okay? So it's kind of like this uncontrolled sort of activity of the brain. And they can happen, you know, in certain specific areas, or they can be more global. We don't need to talk about different types of seizures right now. But um, anyway, that's why we have benzodiazepines given after the seizure. Okay. Um, oh, all right. Let's finish this, and I'll ask you one more question, probably. Okay. What pathologic effects of cocaine on cardiovascular physiology? led to Ms. Hernandez cardiac arrest. I think we already kind of talked about that. I already kind of gave it away, didn't I? What'd you guys put for this though? Somebody tell me what you wrote for this one. Annabelle, what'd you write for this one? Sorry. Is she there? I'm here. What'd you write for this one? Six, number six. I wrote that cocaine has very detrimental effects on cardiovascular um, system, um, obviously cause cardiac arrest. Um, it decreases oxygen supply as it constricts the coronary arteries, aka vasoconstriction, which leads to a lack of oxygen blood flow that could cause a myocardial infarction that could lead to a cardiac arrest. Okay. I mean, based on just info that's here, I mean, if we're going to kind of keep it specific here, I guess they're sort of referring to the cardiac dysrhythmia, right? that then obviously after the next time or you know, subsequent times when, she, when this happened, it then was too much um, and led to cardiac arrest, right? Um, all right, thank you. So, so Annabelle probably added in a little extra information, but that's fine. Um, all right, any, oh, one other thing. So what, so remember we had, um, or I kind of had different categories of substances in chapter six, right? So co cocaine fits into which one of those categories? What is it? Stimulant, right? So cocaine is a stimulant. Heroin, what, what in general, um, you know, those that fit in our opioid category. But in general, when you think about heroin or other opioids, what would you, what would you think the overall effects of those are on the body? 
Are they stimulating? Well, euphoria is just a result of most of these, right, in terms of that feeling. But in terms of physiologic effects, if you think about cocaine as a stimulant versus heroin, which is an opioid, what in general do opioids, what general effects do opioids have on the body? Not Annabelle, somebody else. So I'll give you two choices. Are they stimulating or do you think they're inhibitory in general? Inhibitory? Inhibitory. Yes, inhibitory. Opioids in general are substances that are inhibitory, okay? So decreases respiratory rate, right? Decreases respiratory rate so much so that you're not breathing, getting oxygen, and then, then that's how you die, right? So these are, those, those are all kind of slowing, pulling everything down, whereas cocaine is a stimulant, right? Which is essentially kind of opposite. Now, in terms of kind of body effects, sometimes, just I'll just kind of put this out there, um, sometimes if you just look at one particular symptom, maybe like say like uh, the effects on heart rate or something like that, Sometimes, um, I don't know how I want to say this. Sometimes the effect may sort of seem paradoxical based on what you know about the substance. But just remember that things are complicated when we talk about physiology, right? But um, so you have to always kind of take multiple symptoms together, right? You can't just kind of look at one because there's always going to be multiple symptoms that influence, say, or multiple systems that influence one system or, you know what I mean, um, one thing like heart rate. It's not just one, one system or one mechanism that's going to affect it, right? So just kind of keep that in mind. You're talking about taking a substance, right, into your entire body. So it's effects that it, the effects it's going to have on the brain are different than the effects that it's going to have on the periphery, right? And so there's, there's a lot kind of going on. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there, right? Um, and that's true of everything that we do in pathophysiology, right? Um, things are, are always more complex than we can really cover in our class, right? So anyway, just kind of a word of caution or just to kind of keep those things in, in mind, right? These, these things are complicated. That's why uh, I always say that, right? Like that's why scientists and clinicians will never not have a job, right? Because understanding how the human body works or any one specific organ works is super, super difficult, right? We don't know everything. We never will. Um, all right, questions about that, guys? Okay, so any other questions about chapter six? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to chapter eight. No? I have a question. So for this, were we just supposed to do the part about um, Juliet Hernandez, not the other part about the guy? Correct. Oh, <laughs> well, I did both. <laughs> There's the instructions. Uh, it's fine. Listen, but it's fine. It's your benefit if you did both. Yeah. Right? I would say good idea to look at the other one anyway when you're studying. Right? Remember, like for the exam, I could use I could use that other one, right? Or pieces from it. So yeah, I just assigned one. I guess I could have assigned both, but um to your benefit to look at both anyway. All right? <laughs> yeah. They're both there. Yeah, they're both there just because I didn't pull the other one out. Um, it would have just be me copy pasting it into another one rather than you guys just reading one. So I just left them both in there. Yeah, so it's okay. Like I said, it's your benefit to do both of them anyway. All right, guys. I'm go oh, any other questions about like chapter six? No? All right, so let's move on to chapter eight. So the first thing we're going to do, um, I'm going to kind of intro the chapter. I'm basically just going to show you the first slide. Then I'm going to have you guys basically start to define some terms. I don't know if anyone looked at chapter eight, read it, or looked at the PowerPoint. Um, there's lots and lots of terms, right, medical terms. Um, and they'll come up. Like, we'll kind of do them ahead of time, but they're going to come up again as we go through the chapter. They're also going to come up again as we go through the course, okay? So that's what we're going to start off with. So everyone should get the, not that. Oh, I didn't download it yet. All right, wait one second. Let me go get it. I thought I did. Apparently not. 
So let's all get the review sheet, the exam two review sheet, okay? So that's right here, right? Exam two review sheet. So everyone get that, have that handy. Okay, um, so hopefully we've sort of added in notes for chapters five and six already, or we're gonna do that soon. Remember the completed exam two review sheet is due on Monday, okay, October 5th. Um, and that means I'm going to look to make sure you have all of these definitions. So that's what I'm gonna have you guys kind of do first. And you guys can do this together in groups or whatever. Um, you can, I don't care how you look up the definitions, but I want us to just kind of right off the bat, just know some of these definitions and just kind of review them. So some are listed here, but just don't start doing it yet, but some are listed here. Then there's also some other terms that are in this first slide that I'm gonna show you, okay? So basically I left space in that, on that review sheet to basically write in the terms and the definitions, okay? So let me, so everyone should have that handy. Let me pull up the PowerPoint. You can get rid of that. The PowerPoint is in here, unit three lectures. If you pulled up the chapter eight PowerPoint like before 11 o'clock today, it's not the same, it's different. I added to it and, and updated it. Um, so make sure you look at the version that's there. I always put the new one up every, every time I update it, but. Um, and then the one that's in the recorded lecture is always the sort of finalized version. All right, so let's, let's take a look at this. All right guys, so chapter eight is fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Now, unit three, which is chapters eight and nine, okay, is um, fluid and electrolyte imbalance and then also acid base imbalances okay i didn't cover chapter nine last year because i wanted to kind of move on and make sure we kind of hit on you know as much as we can throughout this one semester i mean probably this course really should be a year long not just one semester um so so anyway i'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about kind of why those two are related right why are fluid and electrolyte imbalance and acid base imbalances put together in the same unit Right? What do you guys think? What do you, I mean, I guess, um, well, let's, 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 let's ask this, I guess. Somebody tell me why um, it's important for your body to maintain appropriate fluid levels, meaning, i.e., water levels, slash electrolyte levels, or how do the two influence one another? What are we talking about here? What do we mean by this? By a fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Yes, homeostasis, right? Meaning, correct, there is a certain level that water needs to be maintained and electrolyte levels need to be maintained at. Correct. Okay, but why is it important to maintain those levels, I guess? They also influence like nerve and muscle function. Correct, they can. Yep. And we talked about that in neurobiology a lot. Yeah. Who remembers? What, you know, if we talk about an action potential, right? Who's in neurobiology, Marianne? Who else was in neurobiology? Annabelle? Yeah. Yes, I was also in it. Oh. oh, there's a lot of you guys that were in neurobiology that are here. So we talked about an action potential. What two ions did we talk about exhaustively? Thank you, sodium and potassium. Good. What? Who, who was that? Oh, were you just say, were you saying the same thing I was saying? <laughs> it's like, oh, did I hear something? At least you guys can hear them too through the PSA. Yes, I don't think I'm crazy. Um, anyway, so yeah, so muscle contraction, right? Nerve conduction, electrolytes, i.e. sodium, potassium, super important, right? If you don't have enough sodium or you have too much sodium, it's going to affect those processes, right? Um, also, the other thing I wanted to kind of point out, and this is sort of, um, let's, let me show you this. It would be cool if I actually could put the slideshow on. Right, so 
Um, oh no. Okay. So this is kind of the chapter overview, but over, and I apologize if this is crystal clear, but I had to do it as a screenshot from the e-text because for some reason they don't have the figures in easily uh, retrievable forms for this textbook. But this is a figure here that basically shows you um, things that are affected by both um, imbalances of fluid and electrolytes and also acid base. So bottom line is, if fluid and electrolyte imbalance is off, it also affects acid base balance and vice versa, okay? And so that's why we talk about them together. So let me ask you this question. And again, we're not really gonna cover this in that much detail, except that I definitely want you guys to know, that's a little boring, huh? Some of these terms, okay? Um, what, what about pH? Why, what, what about pH in terms of maintaining appropriate pH levels? Uh, in the blood, right? In the body. Why is that important? Correct, but why is it dangerous if you have acidosis or alkalosis? Uh, like they can burst or... Okay, the wait one second, two become... people. Manuel, go ahead, say it louder. So I said that your enzymes specifically function at a specific pH and it's like the fog that could be used for them. Yeah, right, proteins, enzymes, they function at a specific pH. If it's off, whether it's too acidic or too basic, those enzymes will not be able to function. Remember, if one enzyme can't function, it's a major, major problem, right? Um, so also can lead just in general to cellular injury, right? I mean, if enough enzymes or proteins aren't working, cell, cells can die, okay? If cells die, that's a problem as well, okay? So just remember, maintaining appropriate fluid, electrolyte levels, and acid-base levels are basically, um, you know, it's, it's life-dependent. Okay, um, a slight alteration in any of these are very dangerous, okay? And have sort of global effects. Um, all right, so for right now, I think we kind of talked about all of these here, um, the chapter overview here, right? So when we say electrolytes, those dissociate into ions and water. So when we say electrolytes, we're kind of referring to, since your body has lots of water, right? We're referring to sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions, calcium ions, Bicarbonate ions, right? So those are, that's what we're talking about, okay? Um, so as we move through the chapter, we talk about sodium, then we talk about potassium, then calcium. So it goes through all of the different electrolytes. The beginning of the chapter sets up kind of general things that we need to consider, and then we specifically talk about each one, okay? So it kind of gets a little, almost gets kind of a little redundant in terms of sometimes some of the electrolytes sort of overlap in their effects, okay? So just kind of gonna have to bear with the end of the lecture a little bit. Um, all right, so what I want you guys to do now, oh, this link tells you about this ABG, these arterial blood gases. So if you're curious, let's see if my link works. I tested it before it worked, but... <clears throat> Right, so this just explains what arterial blood gases are, right, what the test is. And again, this is, um, you know, it, it basically assessing levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide, okay? If carbon dioxide levels increase or decrease, it basically changes the pH of the blood, okay? And so it's super important um, to sort of maintain those levels, just like everything we're talking about. In, these two, in this chapter. Okay, so anyway, that was a, uh, you guys can take a look at that if you want. Okay, so what I want you to do is go back to that review sheet, and when I was talking about other terms, it was these guys in the purple here. So let's see if I can make this bigger and we can actually see them. I'm gonna have to write them down. Hypernatremia, hyponatremia, hypochloremia, Hyperchloremia, hypochloremia, right? And then hypo, so it's basically sodium, calcium, potassium. <coughs> I'll write them, I'll write them out for you guys. So just start with what I have there already. I'll write them on, on here, okay? 
So let's start with defining electrolyte, homeostasis. Those are kind of already defined on that first slide, but in your own words, define them. Metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis. For any of these, when you look them up, add in some symptoms maybe that you come across, okay? I'm not concerned about the definitions, but I think it's good to kind of know some of the symptoms that are associated with these, but we're gonna talk about those specifically. But if you come across kind of some, kind of some symptoms or some effects of these, then jot them down. Yeah. On non computer shows that the leaking is a long term. What? It is not like the track for the actual file. Yeah, it's not. It's in a separate thing. I just pulled it from Moodle. Here. It's right here. Right here. Exam two review sheet. I know. I clicked on that and there's no um, word document. I don't know what to do. I just literally clicked on it and got the document from there. Click on it and then it downloads the word document. It's right there. If you go into the um, this, it's not there. Yeah, but here it is. I took it out of there because it wasn't the updated one. So I don't want somebody to pull that one up. Okay, so it's right there. You guys all have that review sheet? All right, so I'm going to list those other terms. So that you guys know which ones I'm talking about. So I'll just do that here. Oopsie. So you guys can start working on these that are already there, right? So you guys should be physically writing with the pencil or typing the definitions of these terms. See what you find. Just you can kind of just do a quick Google. Google search. I don't. I don't care. Like it's not. This isn't meant to be like anything crazy. Um, just do a quick Google search and jot down definitions. What? Here. Yeah, because I ch I updated the review sheet. Yeah. So I'm gonna add them right now. Okay. So I'll just leave this up here. So they're here. All right. So what I have up on the screen, guys, are the ones that I want you to do. So I'm just going to add to them. Oh, why don't I have capital? So we'll just spend a couple minutes doing this and then we can move on, but you guys, I want, this needs to be on your review sheet when you guys hand it in, okay? Somebody doesn't like that, either. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Jeez. I lost it on my freshman yesterday. They, they were like, whoa. I might not be able to spell it. Oh, they're back. <laughs> <laughs> I probably spelled that right. I mean, wrong. I don't know. I think it's right? I think it's I know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I said, these are going to come up as we go through the chapter, but let's just kind of quickly be exposed to them at least. Ooh, hard to write them out too without misspelling them. I know. 
Yeah, it's probably right. So I'll just, we'll just kind of, like I said, we'll, we'll check on a couple of these. You guys can tell me a couple of the definitions and then we'll move on. We're going to do every single one. Since obviously they should have a little redundant, I guess. Did I spell that? I spelled, spelled that wrong. Hypermagnesemia. All right, I guess that's enough for now. Yes, I'm not to do this. All right. All right, so just like five more minutes or so, guys, and then we'll just kind of hit on a few of these and see what we got. So I will also put this, I'm going to replace the review sheet that's there with this one as you guys are finishing up. Nope. All right, guys, so what do we got here? Let's start at the top. Um, what'd you put for electrolyte? How would you define or explain electrolyte? I already did it, I think, in the beginning of class. What's an electrolyte? They're like ions, so like the potassium ions and, um, and sodium ions. Okay, so they remember they dissociate in water, correct, yeah. and end up being ions. Okay, all right, good. What about homeostasis? How do you, how would you define this or why do we have homeostasis in this chapter? Again, we already talked about this, but what'd you write down for that? Okay, internal balance. So in this case, we're talking about internal balance of water and electrolytes, right? Yeah, I put internal balance. Okay, cool. All right, what about metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis? What do we mean by metabolic? 
Say it louder, Chrysantha. What'd you find when you, when you searched this? What was the definition you found? Somebody just read me the definition for metabolic acidosis. Okay. Oh. okay. Go ahead. Oh, for metabolic acidosis, when you just look it up, it says it says a condition in which too much acid accumulates in the body. Okay, but why? What's the difference, I guess, between metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis? Wouldn't it be like as a result of like metabolic reactions, so like the making and breaking of like um, bonds and like making like anabolism and catabolism kind of? Yeah, I mean, it often has to do with um, like nutritional like intake, right? So for instance, example, metabolic alkalosis will result as a, or will happen as a result of vomiting. Okay, so excessive vomiting can lead to metabolic alkalosis because you, have you end up with deficits in water and chloride, um, also in potassium. Um, and so, so again, it's going to induce that. When we talk about alkalosis, what do we mean? What's the alkalosis refer to and what does the acidosis refer to? When we say alkalosis, what's happening to the pH? It's going up. Increasing. It's increasing. So More the pH. OH concentration is going up. Correct. So the pH is increasing. More alkaline, right? If we're talking about acidosis, I think it's pretty obvious, right? The pH is going to decrease. When we talk about respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, what's, what's causing the change in pH there? Respiratory rate and ventilation. Yeah, like what though? Oxygen, oxygen. carbon dioxide. Well, correct. It has to do with levels of oxygen, carbon dioxide, but what's, I guess, something you know, if you talk about like hyperventilation or hypoventilation, right, those are going to lead to respiratory alkalosis or al uh, acidosis, okay? Um, so hyperventilation will lead to respiratory alkalosis, um, hypo respiratory acidosis, because if you're talking about hypoventilation, you end up having increased levels of carbon dioxide, right? Hypo, too little increase carbon dioxide, decrease oxygen. If you have increased carbon dioxide levels, it increase or decreases the pH of the blood and makes it more acidic, okay? So again, this is why I wanted you guys to kind of look up some of these um, terms. Um, these all here, the hypernatremia, hyponatremia, I mean, it's kind of, it's pretty obvious and a little redundant, right? So hypernatremia is what? What do we mean by hypernatremia? Increased sodium level. Thank you. In the blood, right? Emia refers to in the blood. Hypo? Decreased. Hyper means increase, hypo means decrease. So therefore, hype, without even looking them up, hyper or emia means what? What's the ion? Chloride. Chlorine, right? What is it? Chloride, right? Chloride. Um, decreased chloride levels, right? Hyperkalemia is what? Increase what? Potassium. Potassium. Mm -hmm. um, hypo, decrease potassium. Hypercalcemia is what? Sounds like calcium. Correct, sounds like calcium, increased calcium, right? In the blood, hypo, decreased calcium. What about hyperphosphatemia? Sounds like what? Phosphate, increased phosphate, decreased phosphate for hypo. And then hypermagnesemia, what do you think that is? Magnesium, magnesium. increase or decrease, okay? So these are all important electrolytes, right? Slash their ions, right? Again, in our body because they're water there. Okay, um, so if you have an excess or too, you have too much or too little, it's going to cause problems, okay? And that's what we'll talk about as we move through the chapter. So because we're not gonna talk too much about metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, and respiratory alkalosis, 
make sure your definitions of those are pretty, pretty lengthy, okay? And then we'll come back to them again on Monday. Um, you know, and you can find them in the book. We talk about a little bit, particularly in the intro um, to unit three, but you guys can look them up. It's really not that hard to find information on that, right? So make sure you have a pretty, pretty lengthy um, definitions for these four here, right? Okay, guys, so for metabolic acidosis and alkalosis and for respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis, okay? Gave you a little bit of information. We talked about the respiratory acidosis and alkalosis if you think about hyperventilation or hypoventilation, okay? Um, for metabolic, I gave you an example of excessive vomiting inducing metabolic alkalosis, okay? So make sure you have a decent amount of notes on those four terms there. Okay, so let's move on. So I did update the review sheet that's there on Moodle to this one with all the terms, okay? Questions about anything here, guys? All right, so let's just move on to talk about chapter eight a little bit more. Oh, whatever. You can adjust the spacing in there as you need. Let me, let me just pull this up. So like I said, what I will do is I will still upload an entire recording of this. Um, oh, we don't want that. Oops, let me get out of here one second and fix this. Um, I won't just pick up where we left off, put it that way. Whatever, let's just go to the next slide. Okay, so this is kind of the, as most chapters start, right, the concepts related to fluid and electrolytes, right? And there's that same diagram. This thing is so annoying. Let's, let's get this all the way out of the way. Why doesn't it minimize completely? There we go. Okay. Okay, so in terms of fluid levels, right, again, electrolyte levels and fluid levels work hand in hand, right? They're going to influence one another, okay? Um, so like if you had an increase in sodium levels, that's then going to affect water levels, okay, or fluid levels, okay? So that's why we talk about them together. You really can't talk about them separately. And when you talk about regulation, it always involves both. Um, so some things that fluid in the body affects, right? So meaning if you have, if your fluid levels are not where they're supposed to be, what kind of, what kind of things will it affect, okay? Um, workload of the heart. So if you have an increase in fluid, right? Oops, that's, that's a typo. It's supposed to be causes and, not and increase. Causes an increase in, in blood pressure, right? Excess fluid. There's more fluid in your, in your vascular system, increased blood pressure, okay? Your heart has to work harder to compensate for the increase in fluid, okay? If you have a deficit in fluid, it's also gonna impact the workload of the heart because the heart's gonna have to beat faster to compensate for that loss of fluid, okay? If you talk about vital signs, there's more that I could have listed here. Um, I kind of mentioned this already, increase, decrease blood pressure, depending if you have an increase in fluid or a decrease in fluid, um, increase or decrease heart rate, et cetera. There's gonna be other changes in vital signs as well. Um, and now those changes in vital signs could be a result of something else, but they also may just indicate um, an issue with fluid levels, okay? Um, formation of edema. So what's edema, guys? Swelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, build up a fluid. That's all it is, right? Exactly. And you can kind of palpate it by pressing, and if if it kind of stays raised, that means there's probably excess fluid there, right? So edema forms if you think about excess fluid again in your vascular system. Um, you know, think about a hose, right? If you kind of, I don't know, right? Okay, so you kind of think of it as being kind of kind of closed on one end, right, or whatever. But you put a whole bunch of water in there. Eventually that hose is only gonna be able to hold a certain amount of fluid, right? It's gonna start leaking out the side of the hose. That's what happens with the blood vessels. So if there's so much excess fluid in the blood vessels, fluid leaks out into the interstitial space and that's what leads to edema, okay? So, um, and we'll talk more about edema later on in the chapter, okay? But edema is a big thing um, with fluid and electrolyte imbalance, okay? Um, also, you can have that fluid accumulating in the lungs, which will lead to problems with oxygen. But just a quick question yeah. about when the blood um, leaks out. Not blood, that leaks uh, out. 
fluid, just fluid. like it leaks right. out of the blood vessel. Doesn't that happen anyway with the lymphatic system? Well, the lymphatic system will fit, pick up excess fluid, but this is this is more fluid than it should be. Okay. There's always a certain amount of fluid there in that space. And correct, lymphatic vessels will pick that up, right? But if it's too much, the lymphatic system won't be able to pick it up. Okay. Um, all right. So if you have fluid accumulating in the lungs, it's going to lead to dysfunction, right? And problems with oxygenation. So these are um, some sort of body, you know, a couple body effects of fluid imbalance. Um, if you think about concentration of electrolytes, so right, this is more, this top part is more focusing on the fluid part of it, right? Whereas this is just giving an idea, okay, well, what happens if certain electrolytes are off in terms of levels, right? Influences electrical signals. We said that already. Why? What are we, what are we, what are we referring to there? Action potential, right? Sodium and potassium. If sodium and potassium levels are not where they're supposed to be, um, it's going to lead to a problem with electrical signals being conducted, right? Which can lead to what? Disorientation and things like that. So there are sort of nervous system effects of fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Why? Because of this, right? Okay. Um, cardiovascular function, we kind of already mentioned that a little bit, but also this has to do with cardiovascular function in your heart. It's a muscle. Do you guys agree? Okay. So in terms of what are some electrolytes that muscles use? Calcium. So calcium is important in neurotransmitter release in neurons, but in muscles, right? Contraction is dependent on calcium. Muscles can't work without calcium, also without sodium and potassium as well, right? Because we're still talking about action potential. Um, but calcium is a big one there. Okay, so obviously cardiovascular function, your heart is a muscle. If these electrolytes are thrown off, then it's not going to be able to function, okay? Um, oh, look at this next, we're gonna look at this next slide here. It says he's elevated through blood chemistry. I put that because I was like, huh, what? And so now this is basically just showing you some of the values. Do you need to memorize this? Yes. No. Um, you don't, right? But these are, you know, I mean, again, you can take blood, right? Look at serum levels of these electrolytes. Normal values are here. And so we know if you're above the normal value for sodium, what does that mean? What's the medical term for that? So say that level was 200. You're hypernatremic. Yeah, there you go. What if it was 90? Hypo. Okay. So anyway, giving you an idea of levels. Okay. So like I could give you this information and say, all right, here's, you know, here's the blood level from the patient. You know, tell me, are they, is it, you know, what's the medical name for, for that, right? Hypernatremia or hypo, um, hypercalcinemia, whatever. And then what, what are the effects of that, right? What are, what are some of the issues that are going to be caused by that imbalance? Okay. Not to We're going to talk about that. Yeah? Huh? Sorry, you kind of cut out. Did you say that we have to like memorize the table? Yes. Okay. I'm lying. You don't have to memorize it. Just kidding. Oh, okay. Because I, that part cut out. So I was like, did she make a joke? You also were, can't were see my face. So. I can make lots of jokes behind my mask and nobody knows what's going on. Yeah, okay. Oh no, don't memorize it, but let's be aware, right? And I was just saying that I could give you guys, you know, this table and then give you a patient, you know, reading and you guys obviously would be able to tell me if it was hypernatremia versus hypo, right? And then what the effects are. We're gonna talk about that as we move through. Okay, um, so here's that figure that's in every chapter. Um, in terms of concepts related to fluids and electrolytes, as you can see, they're pretty, pretty vast. Yeah. So take take a look at this. Now, again, like I told you, fluid and electrolyte balance and acid base balance influence each other. Okay. If one's off, the other one's going to be off as well. Okay. And so that's why we kind of talk about them together. That's also why I thought maybe it's okay to kind of leave off 
the entire chapter nine, um, just because we kind of touched on it in chapter eight a little bit. Um, anyway, if you guys can see the sort of main concepts that are closest to the center there, right? Like perfusion, elimination, mood and affects, intracranial regulation, acid base balance, and then those sub concepts that are more towards the outside there. Okay. Here gives you some more information on these terms that I told you guys make sure you define on that review sheet, right? Metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, and respiratory alkalosis. Okay? So make sure you have that on your review sheet and you're sort of familiar with those terms. Hmm. So if you look at intracranial regulation there, why do you think, I don't know, why do you think you see seizures as a result of electrolyte imbalance? Well, because like it affects like the electrical activity of the brain, right? Yeah, correct. Um, so let's kind of like make a little guess here. So which electrolyte and an excess or a deficit of would make, would you think would maybe lead to seizures? Hyponatremia. Would you say? Hypo? Hyponatremia, low sodium. So why low sodium? It has to do with like, um, obviously like muscle contraction and so does a seizure have, think about brain, not, not muscle contraction, it's a seizure. Increased brain activity. What happens during the action potential? I don't know, we're just trying to think here, right? So I guess like maybe hyper, because you said like increased brain activity. I don't know which one though. Yeah, well, anyway, I'm just, I'm just trying to kind of like, look, we got to think about some of these kind of things, right? So, um, do I really want to write this out? Maybe we don't, we don't need to, maybe we don't need to go that far with it. But if you think about an action potential, right? Remember, you have like that, it looks like a curve like this, right? Where you have um, the membrane potential increasing, right? To a certain point, and then it comes back down, okay? Does anyone, and what do we call the membrane potential increasing? What's the term for that? Anyone remember that? Depolarization. Good. And what, what electrolyte, what ion is mostly responsible for depolarization? Sodium. Is it potassium? No. What happens? Sodium, there's lots of sodium outside the cell normally, right? in the extracellular fluid, and we'll talk about that. So during action potential, those sodium channels, right, remember, we have these voltage-gated sodium channels, they open up and sodium goes into the cell. The increased concentration of positive ions in the cell causes the membrane potential to rise, right? So I guess you could think of if you had more sodium around, you may be sort of, it may be easier to kind of generate these action potentials, you have this increase in activity, um, but also, Potassium levels would affect this as well. So the big ones in terms of the seizure activity are sodium and potassium. Okay. I, don't know, I would probably say hyper, but I think it's a little more complicated than that. That's why I was like, eh, we don't want to go too far with that. But I just wanted you guys to kind of think about like which electrolytes would be involved in in you know initiating, say maybe a, a seizure, right? All right. Anywho, we'll move on. So make sure you kind of pay attention to. So Dr. C, yeah. So which um, electrolytes did you say um, leads to seizures? Because like I was looking it up, and it does say like hyponatremia yeah. and hypoglycemia and so forth. Yeah. So it's all of those, right? So the idea is sodium ions, potassium ions, um, and magnesium too. That's what they say. Yeah, and magnesium. They all are going to be sort of involved in this. I would think the big one that I would think of would be sodium right? Changes and alterations in those sodium levels. And it's uh, hypo? I mean, I don't, I don't know if you guys need to worry about which one it is, right? Okay. Just know that, I, again, what I was trying to get at is sort of um, what electrolytes would potentially probably be 
um, involved in the initiation kind of seizures. And actually, there are more, you know, you think of sodium probably and potassium as the big one, but yeah, magnesium also involved. Magnesium more, I think, with muscle contraction um, than that, but potentially any magnesium is going to influence electrical activity of cells, of muscle and, and, and brain cells. Um, all right, so anyway, we can kind of think about that a little bit and just kind of think about that as you look at some of these other things that are sort of along the outside, okay? That's, I just wanted you guys to kind of get, get to thinking about that. But yeah, sodium being the main one that we probably think about there. Okay, um, I guess we're not, we're, we're done, okay? So, you know, the first part of this chapter talks about, again, in general, setting up for kind of talking about hypernatremia, hyponatremia, and what's happening with each one. Um, the first part of the chapter is a little more sort of general, big picture, and then we get more specific, okay? So I'll upload the entire recording of this chapter, okay? So it will be up today. Um, I just wanted to go through as much as I kind of could, but we didn't really get through that much, but anyway. Huh? Like I mean, it's probably gonna be more than an hour. Um, yeah, but I mean, at least you can pause it. Yeah. At least you can pause and, you know, get a snack and come back, right? <laughs> so yeah, it'll probably be slightly more than an hour, okay? I do have to, mo I'll probably modify some of the slides towards the end a little bit more just to add a little more detail or pull something out if I don't, if I feel like we don't really need it. So. That's that. So make sure we're going to listen to this chapter eight lecture, finish that review sheet and do the chapter eight case study for Monday, okay? And then um, exam is Wednesday. All right, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.